Now, grab your Bibles and go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can actually go to 1 Corinthians 14 to start with. We're continuing our series on the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We've been studying these nine particular supernatural gifts. We are seeing the Holy Spirit move here at Life Church. We are a church that believes. I don't like titles. Some people say, well, are you a Pentecostal church? Well, yes, we believe that what God did on the day of Pentecost, He's still doing today. But sometimes when you think Pentecostal, you think somebody with their hair bunned up on their head wearing a long dress and no makeup. And that's not us. There's, we're not into, into legalism. But, and then some would say, well, are you charismatic? And I'd say, well, yes. But then some, you know, we believe in the charismatic, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some people, when they think charismatic, maybe they think people that kind of get out in left field of the fringe. But I guess the, the best title I could give us as a church is that we're just spirit-filled. We, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we believe God still fills His believers with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what we're studying about and learning how to walk in these gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says this, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire. Eagerly desire. Did you catch that? Eagerly desire the gifts of love. The Spirit. Not only is God still pouring out the gifts of the Spirit, He tells you in the Word, you should eagerly desire them. Why should you desire them? Because they're good. James 1 verse 17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above. So why in the world would we possibly not want to get good gifts from God? And God is not going to give us anything that's not good. And can I just tell you, you never, ever ever have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. You never, ever, ever have to be afraid of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you a story. My first experience with a Spirit-filled Pentecostal charismatic church was when I was 16. And as I have testified in previous sermons in this message, I was not raised in a Spirit-filled church. I was raised in a very anti-Holy Spirit church where they said God did not do those things anymore, that all the gifts of the Spirit ceased after the last apostle died. And, you know, they, they said if you see anyone praying in tongues or prophesying or doing any of that, they're either, they're either faking it or they're demon-possessed or they're mentally insane, one or the other. There's something wrong. God doesn't do that anymore. And so I'm 16 years old, and I am traveling around playing piano for this Southern Gospel Quartet, an old-fashioned Southern Gospel Quartet made up of four really, really old-fashioned Baptist guys. You know, and that's not, I'm not knocking the Baptist church. They just were not Pentecostal guys, okay? They just, they, they, they were in a church sort of like mine, my church that I was raised in. They called themselves an independent, premillennial, fundamental, missionary Baptist church. And it was in the bylaws of the church that any ad that went out on radio or, or in newspaper had to say, an independent, fundamental, missionary, Baptist church. And the, uh, these guys were raised in a, in a similar church that said God doesn't do Holy Spirit things anymore. That was just for the apostles in the first century church. And so anyway, we get, we get a gig at this, uh, this Church of God revival on Thursday night. And so here we are, and this, this was an old-fashioned Church of God. This was a truly Pentecostal church, okay? We're there, and my, my little group gets up, and they sing their old-fashioned quartet songs, and the people are real polite, and they applaud after every song. And we do our 30-minute set, and then we're done. Then the Church of God got their musicians and their choir up. And that's when the praise started, folks. When I showed up, I happened to notice my band director from high school was there. And, and he said, hey, why don't you come sit with me? And so I went up to the front row to sit with him. Let me just say, the front row in an old-fashioned, really spirit-filled Church of God church might not be the best location for a 16-year-old boy who has been told that doesn't happen anymore to get his first experience. But uh, I'm sitting up there on the front row, and the choir gets to singing, and all of a sudden that place just lights up. People, everybody is just dancing and jumping and shouting. And my band director is leaping up and down and jumping and twirling and praying in tongues right beside me. I look back to the 16th row where my four Baptist friends are back there. <laughs> White as a ghost. They are, they're about as freaked out. And I'm thinking, why didn't I sit on the 16th row? I could sneak out the back door. Oh, my goodness. Everybody, there was, there was tongues everywhere. It, and I, I will tell you, I will be honest, it, it was a bit, 
chaotic and wild. And, you know, sure, could, could maybe things have been administered a little better. Maybe somebody could have stood up, explained what was going on. Or, you know, if you, there's, you know we've been, we took the whole first week of this series to study 1 Corinthians 14. And it's not just important that we have the gifts. It's also important that we administer those gifts according to the rules God gave us in 1 Corinthians 14. And so things could have been probably more in order and explained better. But can I tell you, when that service was over with, nobody died. Nobody lost their salvation. Nobody became filled with a demon, okay? It was all good. At the end of that service, a whole lot of people were blessed, and maybe five of us were leaving confused. But uh, you know what? It, it had no negative effects. And I tell you that story to tell you, you do not have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. And yes, humans operate in the gifts of the Spirit. So there will be times that somebody may make a mistake. You may get a prophecy sometime, and you'll just know, well, that's just not on it, you know? Uh, God said, don't worry, Brother Bob, your, 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 your gray hair will turn red by this time next week. That thus saith the Lord. You know, you, somebody, well-meaning as they may be, may miss it sometimes because they're human. And sometimes things may not be explained as well as they need to be explained. We strive really hard here at Life Church to be a church where things are done decently and in order because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion in 1 Corinthians 14 and that everything should be done in a proper way. So we work at it, but I'm not going to tell you that we won't ever make a mistake. What I'm going to tell you is even if a mistake's made, we serve a great big God who's able to take care of you. You should never, ever, ever be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit should operate, uh, be operated and administered properly. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 23 says, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers, which would have been me, well, and unbelievers, that would have been me because I wasn't born again at 16 playing gospel music. Uh, it says, when they come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? Well, I'll admit, I left that church of God service that day going, I think they're out of their mind. My band director is a fruit loop. He's just crazy, man. Jumping and screaming and twirling and praying in some weird language. I don't know. What's up with that guy? So it is important that we operate the gifts appropriately. And that's why I've taken so much time in this series to focus on the proper administration of gifts. But you don't have to be afraid. Everybody say, no fear. You do not have to be afraid. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Go to verse 8. And we're going to read through this list of nine supernatural gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. We'll read through verse 10. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still, to another, the interpretation of tongues. Father, I'm just asking you right now to just breathe into us. Breathe into us. Give us revelation from your word. Let your word forever change us. Let it transform the way we think. Let us put on the mind of Christ and be filled with your spirit and flowing with your gifts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just, three things. I'm not going to review as much as last week. Let me just remind you, the word spiritual, uh, the word spiritual or gifts of the spirit, that phrase is translated from the Hebrew word pneumaticos. Pneumaticos means God breathed, wind, God wind powered gifts. These are not mere talents. We're not talking about abilities that you can hone and improve on. We're not talking about having a feeling or a hunch. We're talking about a supernatural move of God where He breathes these gifts into us. Everyone say supernatural. Number two, remember, they're given for the common good. We read that verse, that these gifts are given for the common good, not just for your good. It will bring you good. But always remember, when you're operating in a gift of the Spirit, don't just think about how is it blessing me. Think about how is it benefiting the congregation, especially when we come together. The question is not just, will I enjoy acting or talking or speaking or responding this way to God, but if what I'm doing 
is going to confuse somebody else. It's going to create disorder or, or, or drag somebody down. Then, okay, maybe, maybe I'll worship that way in my private worship, but I want to make sure when I'm in the house of God that I operate in the gifts of the Spirit according to 1 Corinthians 14 so that everything is in order and everybody leaves edified and not confused. Does that make sense? So it's for the common good. And just remember, God's gifts should never confuse or bring disorder because he said in 1 Corinthians 14, I'm not the author of confusion. Some translations say not the author of disorder. So uh, uh, let's move on and let's continue talking about these gifts of the Spirit. Last week I dealt with three gifts. We'll call them the prophetic gifts. Prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. I want to look at four more gifts today. Look at verse 9. It says, to another, faith. Everyone say faith. To another, faith by the same Spirit. I want to talk about this supernatural gift of faith. This is gifted faith, not developed faith. Now, there is a developed faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, consequently, faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. When you hear the Word of God preached, when you hide the Word of God in your heart like David did, then you can build up your faith. You can encourage yourself and strengthen yourself. And you need to do that. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 says to build each other up in the faith. We need to be building our faith. We need to be developing strong faith. But I want to tell you something, folks. Sometimes you will face things that's bigger than your faith. Sometimes you're going to face things just bigger than you, bigger than you can fathom or imagine. And when those times come, come in your life, you're going to want to know, hey, I have a God that can give me the faith to get through that. You are going to want to be able to operate in the gift of faith because the gift of faith is supernatural faith. It's bigger than you. It can help you go far beyond anything you could possibly do yourself. I like to tell the story, so I've, I've told the story many times. Uh, about a gift of faith that God gave me. When we were uh, preparing to come here to start this church, we, uh, I- I'm going to be honest, I, just, I had a real lack of faith. You know, I was very, very concerned, worried about what would we do financially, how would I take care of my family, how would I provide it. And, and honest to goodness, we waited a year and a half, two years longer than we should have to come here and start this church. We were, but we were pastoring a great church. We had a loving bunch of people who were good to us. We were well compensated. We had a great salary, a great, a great retirement uh, package. We had uh, insurance. I mean, we were taken care of. We had a really great church that was growing and thriving. And I just couldn't bring myself to give all of that up when we knew no one in this area. We didn't know a soul. We didn't have any money to to be able to do this. I'm like, God, I just don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how. I kept waiting, thinking, well, maybe some spirit-filled church up here will suddenly need a pastor. And, you know, I'll find out about it, or they'll call me, and maybe that's how God will provide. Or maybe some of my many pastor friends will feel led to support us. And they'll jump in, and they'll pledge. And I even sent out letters and had meetings with pastors. And I wasn't getting anywhere. No one was jumping on board. Every pastor I talked to, hey, our budget's tight. We love you, Pastor David, but we don't what we're going to do. We, we just barely pay our bills. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I just keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And one night on a Sunday night, I went to bed. And uh, we knew we were called to come here. We knew what God had told us to do. I had a word from God to do this. I went to sleep, and my wife laid hands on me while I was snoring. I said, God, you got to give my husband a, a, the gift of faith, or we're going to be here forever. We're never going to move. And she prayed over me that night. And at 5.30 the next morning, I suddenly rose up out of bed, wide awake, and I suddenly hollered out, everybody get dressed, we're going to Nashville, and we're going to buy a house. And we came up here, and we put a bid in on a house that day. Listen, that was not my faith. That was not my faith. On the way home, after putting in, after putting in the bid on that house, on the way home, two churches contacted me and said, Hey, Pastor, we meant to tell you a long time ago we're going to become a monthly supporter of your ministry. We believe in what you're doing and just want to let you know we're standing behind you. Three churches called me on the way home and said, Hey, we want to book you to come preach. We heard about you planning this church and what you're wanting to do, so you're going to need some income. We'd like to bring you in and give you an offering. God just started meeting needs. But let me tell you, folks, Folks, that was not because of me. I did not have the faith to move up here and start this church. It took a gift of faith. And you may face things, whether it's in your, in your marriage, that you think, I just I can't have faith for this marriage. God can give you the gift of faith to see your marriage restored. 
You may not know how you're going to work things out financially. Your God can give, your God will give you the faith to be able to overcome those situations and overcome financially. You may need faith for healing. You may need faith for whatever. I serve a God who loves to give his children faith. See, he realizes sometimes we're all a doubting Thomas. Now, we like, we like to get down on old Doubting Thomas. Remember the apostle who said, I won't believe unless I put my finger in, in the scars. Unless I can touch him, I won't believe that Jesus is really alive. Well, Jesus shows up and says, you can touch me. And he says, it would be better if you had believed without seeing, but go ahead and touch me. I'm thankful that I serve a God who realizes we fall short. And when we fall short and we don't have all the faith that we need, he's good enough to say, let me give you a little faith. Go ahead and touch my side. Go ahead and put your fingers in the scars on my hand. I get it. You know what? You, you, you fail sometimes, but I'm a good God and my mercies are renewed every morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Can I tell you something? After God gave me that gift of faith, I have not once ever worried about our finances or the church's finances. I've had many opportunities to be worried. I've had some, honestly, I've had a few times in the beginning years of this church, I should have just been plumb scared, but I wasn't because I'm still li- I was still living off that gift of faith. And I just knew my God was going to take care of it. We reached a point once, and forgive me for, for giving testimony so much here, but uh, we reached one point where we had, we had depleted our life savings to keep the church going. We had depleted our retirement to keep the church going. We charged up every credit card that we had to keep the church going. And then we reached the end. Bank account's empty. Credit cards are full. Church bank account's empty. We're like, I don't know what we're going to do now, but hey, I'm living off of a gift of faith. And I said, God, I just know you'll take care of this. I went to church that next Sunday. A guy walks in that we'd never seen before. He says, boy, this is the church I've been looking for. Praise the Lord. I am so glad I found you. By the way, I need to write a tithe check. It was for $30,000, exactly the amount that, that we and the church were in debt. Hallelujah. God cleared that debt. I'm like, God, I don't know how I'm going to pay off all these things. God said, don't worry. I got this. And I believed him and I trusted him because of a gift of faith. And I just believe this morning, there's somebody here. You need a gift of faith. And I believe you're going to walk out of this building with supernatural faith to believe God to take care of your situation. Amen? (laughs) Hallelujah. Let me move on to the next gift. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9 again, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing. Gifts of healing. Oh, praise God, He is a healing God. Amen? And let me just, again, let me remind you, we're not talking about uh, natural healing. We're not talking about medical healing. We're not talking about being healed by uh, changing the way you eat or, or healing by the way of, uh, you know, taking the right medication. I'm talking about supernatural healing healing from God. And let me, let me tell you, I respect the medical profession. I thank you, doctors and nurses. I thank you for all that you do. I'm thankful for pharmacists and chemists and all the researchers that come up with ways to make our life healthier. I appreciate those who research and find out how our nutrition can help us and how certain herbs and this and that can help us. Man, thank you for what you do. And I, I make use of those resources and I'm appreciative of them. But there are times when what you've got is bigger than what the doctor can deal with. There, there's sometimes, uh, there are times in your life when you may face something that's bigger than a bottle of pills or a bottle of supplements can fix. And in those times, I want you to know we serve a healing God who has supernatural healing available for you. And sometimes, I'm going to be honest, sometimes I think, you know, we could get healed by the doctor or by just changing our diet or, or, or doing this or that. But sometimes I think God just says, let me supernaturally heal you just so you'll know I'm a great God and you can trust me. Let me, let me just bring a supernatural healing in so you can testify to others about how good I am and how I have provided for you. I love the fact that our God gives out gifts of healings. By the way, that word gifts is plural. There are, there are many types of healings that God gives out and uh, healing gifts. Uh, I've heard of people that in their ministry, they, they just have a, a gift for people getting healed from kidney disease. People will show up at these meetings and for whatever reason, people that have got kidney problems, you go in with a kidney infection, you walk out healed. You're just taken care of. I've no, I, I knew a minister once who had a real anointing for dental healings. People would come to his meeting, and he would pray for them, and boom, they could go in with cavities, walk out with completely whole teeth, no problems whatsoever. I even heard of a meeting. I didn't uh, attend it, but I heard of a meeting once where 
uh, people went in with cavities and tooth problems, and they walked out with gold fillings, supernatural gold fillings. Now, I already can sense the skeptics going, well, pastor, don't you think God could have just made their teeth whole and not had to put gold in there? Yes, he absolutely could have. But maybe God was just leaving a little something behind to say, hey, look what I did in your life. So you could open up your mouth and say, I went to church with cavities. Here's the x-rays to prove it. Now look, I got gold filling supernaturally. Came from God. We serve a God who is a God of healing. But not only does He provide physical healing, He'll also provide emotional healing. And more and more, uh, the research that comes in proves that a lot of our physical problems are tied to the emotional problems. So I want you to know my God can heal your emotions just as easily as He can heal your body. So we serve a God who says, you know what, I want... I want I want to set you free from the depression. And listen, I know people, they've been to every counselor, every psychologist, every psychiatrist there is. They've taken every test you can take. They've gotten their personality mapped out. They've tried everything in the world, but they still struggle with anxiety, or they still struggle with depression, or they still struggle with the anger. That's when you need a supernatural healing God who will come in and heal your emotions. Amen? He gives gifts of healing. And let me tell you, sometimes God realizes what you need is spiritual healing. Sometimes what's going on in your life is demonic. It's a spiritual attack. And we, I like the story in Mark chapter 5, verse 8, where this man had been wandering around for years, no clothes on. Nobody could contain him. He was just out of his mind, wandering through cemeteries. And then Jesus shows up. And it says in Mark chapter 5, verse 8, that Jesus said to him, Come out of this man. You impure spirit. Now remember, he was out of his mind. He was emotionally, he was emotionally wrecked. He was mentally wrecked. But then in verse 15, it says, when people came by, they found the man sitting there dressed. He wasn't naked any longer. He was dressed and in his right mind. Jesus set him free spiritually and in the process also healed him emotionally. And I don't know, you may be here this morning and the source of the problems going on in your life may not be physical. And, and while they may be emotional, the, the, the thing may be that Satan's launched an attack against you. Well, I serve a God who can set you free. Amen? I serve a God who can free you from that and you can walk out of here healed. Can I just read you a handful of scriptures that will just help to reinforce and remind you that you have a healing God that's on your side? Psalm chapter 103 verse 2 and 3 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. How many sins does he forgive? How many diseases does he heal? He heals all of your diseases. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, God says to you, my dear friend, I want you to be in good health. That's God's will for your life. He wants you to have good health. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to, the, to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to do what? To heal every disease and sickness. God says, I want to give you the gift of healing. Listen, there are people on your job that need healing. There are people you're going to meet at Walmart that need healing. There are people that you're going to have in your family that need healing. I believe God wants to give out gifts of healing, not just for you to receive the gift. I believe He'd like to use you to lay hands on people and see them recover. Can I tell you, healing is not just a pastor thing, okay? It's not just an evangelist thing. It's not just something you get at a crusade or some special service. God can perform a healing in your office in that cubicle. He can perform a healing in your backyard while you lay hands on your neighbor. Well, we serve a God who gives out gifts of healing. Acts chapter 4, verse 30. You, know, you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Now, that was Jesus. Jesus can heal people. Eh. Well, Acts chapter 4, verse 30 tells us that the church prayed and said, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And you know what God did? He stretched out his hand and he poured out his spirit. And yes, the church laid hands on people and they recovered. Hallelujah. James chapter 5 verse 15 says this, And the prayer offered in faith by an apostle or Jesus will make the sick person well. Did I read that correctly? No. No, it says the prayer offered in faith will, everybody say will, not might, not could, not should, will make the sick person well because our God is a God of healing and He's still pouring out the gift of healing in His church today.
Praise God. Let me move on. I'm going already going longer than I meant to. The gift of discernment is the next gift. Or here in the NIV, it says distinguishing between spirits. Some translations call it discernment. Uh, let, me, uh, let me say that this gift is probably the most undervalued of all the spiritual gifts, although it may be the most important. It is a very undervalued gift. I mean, everybody wants to be a prophet. Ooh, I just feel like I'm a prophet. The Lord's got a word for you, brother. Hallelujah. I'm going to lay hands on you. Everybody wants to be a healer. Everybody wants to, you know, have some showy gift. But I want to tell you, there is nothing more powerful than having the gift of discernment. Let me tell you what discernment is not. It's not intuition. And boy, intuition is wonderful. Ask any mom. They seem to have it in abundance. I mean, a mom will know if that baby, if something's wrong with that baby before it ever cries. She'll just... I know there's just something not right. I know there's something wrong. We need to find out what it is. A mom could walk into a room with two teenage boys not having seen a thing and immediately know something wrong just happened. What did you do? I mean, they've got intuition. They know this stuff. And that's wonderful, and, and that's a great gift to have. It's a great gift to have if you're in the business world to just have intuition, to be able to read people. But this gift of discernment is not reading people. It's not merely having intuition. It's not just uh, being exceptionally perceptive and picking up on things. This is a supernatural gift. Everyone say supernatural. This is a supernatural impartation from the Holy Spirit to where you suddenly know things you otherwise could not know. I can't think of any person that I've ever met in my life that operates as strongly in this gift as my wife. My wife, she, listen, you, people will say, oh, that prophet, he read my book. Or somebody gave me a word of knowledge, and it's like they had, a, they had a camera hidden in my house. My wife will read your book, and she'll see you on her spiritual camera. She just won't tell you about it. That was, I mean, She didn't know stuff. I've learned, anytime my wife tells me, watch out, you need to be careful here. I, I immediately start paying attention because I've never known her to be wrong. We, uh, we were pastoring, not this church, previous church we were pastoring, and this lady shows up. And this lady would have been considered a pillar of the community. She was loved by everybody. She was well known for her musical talent and how gifted she was in many, in many areas of life. And people just loved her. She was popular. And she walks in the church, and our church is like, oh, I can't believe that person is going to be coming to church here. This is so great. This is wonderful. Oh, she's here. My wife comes over to me before service ever starts and says, I'm just warning you, God told me something evil is working within that woman. There's something wrong there, and you need to watch out. Well, our children's pastor at that church, his wife was also very gifted in discernment. She, she hasn't talked to us. She just all of a sudden walks up. Listen, I just feel like I'm supposed to tell you guys there's something wrong with that woman. There's something evil in that woman. I was thankful for the gift of discernment. And my wife tells me, she says, listen, whatever you do, if, if you walk into the sanctuary and the sanctuary is empty and she starts to follow you in, turn around and leave. I just know God's saying that's what you need to do. If you try to walk into the office building and she tries to follow you in and there's nobody there, turn around and leave. I know something is wrong. And uh, sure enough, we found out later this woman had split many churches and even walked into the previous church, unbuttoned her blouse and told the pastor, take me, I want you. And then when he would not take her and he kicked her out of his office, she split the church, got all of her fans who loved her and split the church. And we found out she'd done this kind of stuff in church after church after church. But everybody thought she was great. But praise God for the gift of discernment. I'm thankful that my wife has a, a, an unbelievable ability to see when there's evil lurking somewhere. Amen? You Listen, this. let me tell you, the gift of discernment will save you. It'll save your marriage. The gift of discernment will protect you on your job because you'll be about ready to go into a business partnership with somebody and the Holy Spirit will say, they are not good people. They will bring your business down. You don't need to be in that business partnership. You'll be thinking about hiring somebody to work on your, on your executive team and all of a sudden God will say, not that person. They're going to try to steal your job. They're going to try to take you down. Don't, don't be involved with them. You may be friends with somebody and the Holy Spirit will come and say, you need to separate from that person because... Their bad, uh, their bad company is going to corrupt your good character. You need to pull away. And they may look like they're the most upstanding, wonderful Christian person in the world, but God said, no, stay away from them. They've got a porn addiction. You don't need to be around them. Stay away from that. That's the kind of God we serve. He loves us enough to give us some insight. Is it as showy as the gift of prophecy? No. Okay? You're, you know, when you operate in the gift of discernment, you don't get anybody patting you on the back saying, Oh, Pastor Stephanie, that word, that was just so on it. I've been thinking about that word all day long. Glory to God. 
discernment, everybody just kind of walks away from me like, don't be reading my mind. Don't you read my mind. Don't worry, my wife's not reading anybody's mind. But I'm, I am thankful that I'm married to somebody that has that gift. She doesn't operate in the gift of prophecy, and she doesn't operate in some of the other gifts. But praise God, she operates strongly in the gift of discernment. Amen? Now, for, listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. Kind of like me as a 16-year-old boy being in a Pentecostal church service. I thought, well, people are being foolish. It says they cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Holy Spirit. When you operate in the gift of discernment, it will help you to understand and receive the other gifts God has for you. Praise God. It will help you to understand the things of God. Let me move on. I know it's, it's 12 o'clock. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up really quick here. One more gift I want to cover this morning. The gift of miraculous powers. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. Everybody say miracles. This is a wide-ranging gift and can cover so many things. Jesus constantly operated in the gift of miracles. He turned water into wine. He fed 20,000 people with a little boy's lunch. Did that a couple of times. He walked on water. He raised the dead. But I want you to know it's not just Jesus who works in miracles. He pours out this gift of miracles in his servants today. Can you get an amen? Let me, well, let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. There was a guy named Philip, not not an apostle. He was a deacon. And the word deacon in the Greek is translated from, or it's translated from a Greek word that means one who handles menial tasks. They appointed deacons to hand out food so that the apostles wouldn't have to spend all their time dealing with food and they could be devoted to the ministry of prayer and the teaching of the word. And so they appointed these deacons. Their job was just to handle delegated tasks, simple tasks, to make life easier for those who were leading the church. This guy's a deacon, but he's out sharing the gospel with people, and he ends up winning this, this Ethiopian eunuch to Christ. You remember the story? And, and then he realizes, hey, this guy needs to be baptized. He baptizes this guy, and after he baptizes this guy, look what it says here. It says, um, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Man, that would solve Nashville's transit problem. Lord, I need to be in Franklin right now. Hallelujah. Boom, I'm there. I mean, that would be wonderful. But listen, I'm just being honest with you. This guy was not an apostle. He was not Jesus. He was just somebody in the church that served. And God said, I'll, I'll pour out my spirit on your handmaids, on your servants, and on your children and your grandchildren. He said, on whoever will call, I will pour my spirit out. God will pour miracles into your life just like he poured out miracles in the life of Jesus and the apostles. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to I wanna try to, to move forward. I, I was going to give you example after example of, of people in the New Testament who operated in miracles that were not that were not apostles or Jesus, but I, I just want to move on and uh, and and just kind of kind of wrap this sermon up. One of my favorite testimonies, personally, and I've given this before, and again, I apologize for repeating testimonies. But uh, we had a weather miracle take place in our ministry many many years ago at another church. We had this big Fourth of July celebration we did every year. About ten, twelve thousand people would show up, and and uh, you know we had a we had a, a Chris. Uh, contemporary Christian artists that came. We had a carnival group that came in and pro provided rides and attractions, rock climbing walls and the such. We had vendors. It was a big event. And, of course, we had professional sound companies that came in and did all of this. And, and a storm came in on Saturday night. This storm stretched from Texas all the way to North Carolina and from Gulf Shores all the way into Kentucky. And the weatherman said, for the next 48 hours, it is going to rain everywhere all the time. There is a 100% chance of rain all day and all night. There, it, will, it will not let up. It is going to rain. Well, at 12 o'clock that Sunday morning uh, on, this, uh, on this day, we, uh, our church gathered to pray at the end of service. And we said, Lord, we're going to ask you for 12 hours of no rain. God stopped the rain for 12 hours. All of a sudden, outside, the rain just stopped coming down. I heard some people going, Woo, praise the Lord, it's not raining, hallelujah. And 
man, and we went out, and there's the semi-truck with all the, about $2 million worth of sound equipment, and the guy says, listen, I'm not going to set up. Your stage isn't covered. It's, 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 it's going to start raining any minute now. He brings up the picture of the radar. Listen, the, the, the rain's coming. It's rain all the way from Texas all the way to here. It's not going to stop. I said, listen, set up your sound equipment because we've prayed, and, and we've asked God to keep the rain off for 12 hours, and we believe it's not going to rain. The uh, artist showed up with his band, and they said, we're not getting on that stage. We're not getting on a metal stage that's not covered in the rain. No, not I said, listen, trust me. Set up your equipment. It's not going to rain. Let me, let me make a long story short. It did not rain for 12 straight hours. We've got the radar image at home. We've got a picture. It rained everywhere else, but every time that storm got to Moulton, Alabama, the storm went to the north and sp split, went to the north and south, and then gathered back together about five miles past our little town all day, all evening long. Hallelujah. At exactly midnight, the last piece of equipment got loaded up by all the companies. Everything was indoors. The bottom fell out, and it rained for 12 straight hours nonstop. Why? I mean, I, I get it. Elijah was, was a little better. He did three years with no rain. But I'll take 12 hours. Hallelujah. I'll take 12 hours. I'm just telling you this because I want you to know our God still works miracles. Anybody familiar with Reinhard Bonnke? Tremendous man of God. Millions will show up. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about one and a half, two million people will show up for one crusade. I mean, you, it's, it's a sea of people. That's all you can see are people. But not only does he have millions of people becoming born again in his ministry, he's had multiple people raised from the dead. One particular guy, Daniel Ekachuwu, and I'm probably butchering his name. He's a, he's a, a, a pastor in Africa. He was in a, a serious car accident. His chest was crushed by the steering wheel of the car, and he died. He was pronounced dead. They've got, they've got the doctor's uh, thing where he wrote it out and said, he is pronounced dead at such and such time. Not only was he pronounced dead, they sent him to the mortuary. He goes to the mortuary. The mortuary does not have cold storage. So they immediately start the embalming process. They cut slits in him. They're draining out blood. They're inserting the embalming fluid. Well, about halfway into the insertion of the embalming fluid, uh, the, the mortician said it's like, it's like an electrical current suddenly surged through that man's body and it knocked out the tube, and he could not get the tube back in. He didn't know what was going on. Well, that was at night. And that night, his wife, the pastor's wife, had a dream. And God spoke to her in the dream through, through a vision of her husband. The husband said, why did you leave me in the mortuary? Take me to the Reinhard Bonnke crusade. God's going to raise me from the dead. Now, you've got to understand something. It's been 48 hours. Okay, you realize after 30 minutes without oxygen to the brain, most people have brain damage from that. You go three and four hours if you do come back to life. Many times a person lives their entire life as a vegetable. This guy's been dead for 48 hours, and she shows up, and she says, I'm taking my husband's body, and we're going to church. Can you imagine that? <laughs> you realize he's dead, right? He's going to start smelling just any time because I can't get the embalming fluid in him. And the, the, you know, the mortician's like, no, you need to leave him here because he's going to start stinking. This is not going to, she said, nope. She gets her family. She grabs him up. And boom, they go off to the Reinhard Bonnke crusade. They get there. The sanctuary is completely full. They can't get in up top in the sanctuary. And so they end up carrying him into the basement of the church. And I, I want to say this because it's not about Reinhard Bonnke. Reinhard Bonnke never actually touched this guy. He was down in the basement. There were a bunch of preachers there. I'm guessing maybe it was an overflow area. A bunch of preachers and Christians there suddenly start gathering around this man who's been dead for 48 hours. They lay hands on him, and they start praying. All of a sudden, he sneezes, and then pops up, sits straight up, completely and totally healed. Listen, he is still, yeah, give God praise. He's still alive today. He's in good health. He travels all over the world sharing his testimony about wh what he experienced being dead for two days and then coming back to life. I tell you these stories because I want you to have faith and know that your God can still work miracles in your life. Anybody ever heard of an evangelist named Smith Wigglesworth? Er er early 1900s, man had 14 people raised from the dead in his ministry. Listen, if God can raise 14 people from the dead in one man's ministry, don't you think he can provide a financial miracle for you? I'm thankful for the gift of healing. Healing is not always instantaneous, even though it's a gift. But sometimes God sends miraculous healings. 
And suddenly, what might would have been a healing that takes place over the course of a week or a month, suddenly it's, it's in a moment. It's in a second. Boom, you're healed. So yes, I serve a God who's got a miracle for your physical need. I serve a God who's got a miracle for your marriage. I serve a God that has a miracle for whatever needs you have. He is a, he's a God who is pouring out a gift, a miracle. Praise the Lord.